Over the past couple of years, there is a ton of new 3D printing manufacturers popping up, trying to get into the budget desktop realm of 3D printing. Anycubic is not one of those companies, and they've actually been around for quite a long time. If you've been in the 3D printing community or if you've been browsing for a 3D printer, whether it's FDM or whether it's resin, you've likely heard of Anycubic. They were one of the original kits that I got uh, probably about four-ish years ago, their Anycubic Castle. Uh, was a Delta printer that I picked up, which was a really good deal of around 200 ish dollars. And it was the first Delta printer I was actually able to get uh, up and operational. And two years ago, they released their first resin printer, which was the Photon. The Photon really took the budget resin printer market by storm. There was not really much else that was available. And at the price at the time of around $400 for a really easy to use, relatively reliable 2K LCD screen based printer, uh, it was really impressive. Now, one of their earlier machines was called the Anycubic i3 Mega, and this was their take on the very popular Prusa design of 3D printer. Almost every budget manufacturer tried to make their own version of it, and the i3 Mega was a really popular rendition, and over the years I've had my eyes on it, it's gone through a few different revisions. There's the original Anycubic uh, Mega, there's the Mega S, I think there was another revision, and as of recently, there is the Mega X, and I saw this a couple of months ago on Joel the 3D Printing Nerds channel, and I was like, yes, okay, this is their latest rendition. They've, um, you know, stepped up and put it in this bigger package. I really want to see what this is all about. Now, over the past couple of weeks, I've been testing out the Mega X, which you can probably see the top of behind me right here. And in today's video, we're going to talk about the specs, what my experience has been like, what the prints have looked like, and everything else in between. So without further ado, let's get right into the video. So before talking about my experience or doing any printing, let's do a brief run through of the specs. The build volume is 300 by 300 by 305 in the Z or one foot by one foot by one foot, which is a pretty large 3D printer. The glass plate is their ultra base. So their bed, the bed on this machine is the ultra base, which is essentially like a black glass with like a diamond style texture. I've talked about it many times. A lot of other manufacturers have since gone on to use this style of bed. But as far as I know, Anycubic are the originators of it, and I'm thankful for that because again, and I've mentioned this many a times, that is one of my favorite types of beds. Things stick really, really well to it with little to no extra adhesives, and then when the bed cools down, they pop right off with little to no force at all, which is amazing. The extrusion type on this printer is Bowden, which is the same as their other uh, Anycubic i3 style machines. They did upgrade the extruder to be a uh, higher quality extruder. They say that it's supposed to help with flexible filament printing. Looking at it, it looks very similar to like an E3D Titan style extruder, but maybe slightly different, but definitely that seems to be where the uh, inspiration came from. And the hot end on this machine is actually a E3D like V6 light clone. So the form factor is like the exact same as like an E3D V6, but it's got a PTFE lined um, center, which means that you'll only be able to print up to about 250 roughly Celsius, which is pretty standard on these budget 3D printers. Um, but the cool thing about that is if you, if you did want to get an authentic all metal E3D V6, throwing it in there and updating the firmware should be relatively simple since you, based off what I'm seeing here, do not actually have to print out any additional mounts for it. So the machine is made up of a combination of aluminum and kind of like thinnish sheet metal. Um, so overall, it's pretty rigid. The front of the machine features a touchscreen, which is pretty bright and nice uh, for navigating through the menu and settings. Uh, on the side of the machine, you've got the full-size SD card slot as well as a USB port. So you have the option to um, either directly hook it up to your computer or Raspberry Pi or print off just an SD card if you choose to do so. So for the Z-axis, it does have dual Z-axis lead screws and dual Z-axis motors. And both side has their own end stop, which is pretty cool because they'll go down and this side will hit and it'll level itself out and then the other side will hit and level itself out. So that ensures that the Z axis across from the left to the right stays uniform. And if for some reason there's ever a situation that causes one side to like slop, it'll, when it homes, go down and correct itself. So that's pretty cool. I haven't actually seen that on too many machines. Bed leveling is manual. They do have massive bed leveling knobs, which make it super easy to adjust the uh, leveling of each corner of the print bed. And the electronics and the power supply are underneath the machine. It is a 12 volt machine, which I will talk to you guys a bit more uh, about later on in the video. So the printer showed up in a massive box wrapped in foam and it was multiple times on the inside strap. This ran wrap to 
uh, prevent it from scratching or being damaged in shipping. Inside the box, there was essentially the bottom half of the top assembly, uh, a big bag full of just about every single tool you could ever think of, and a full kilogram of white PLA, which is really cool. A lot of the uh, more budgety 3D printers don't come with full full spools of PLA, so having that's nice because if you didn't already buy any, um, you, you know, you've got a kilogram will last you quite a while to do some test printing on, so that was really neat. As I mentioned, there was a bag of tools that came with just about everything you'd ever need. There was an awesome spatula, a USB, a SD card, a bunch of Allen keys, um, there was a complete entire spare hot end, like from nozzle to heater block to heat sink to Bowden tubing, like everything. So uh, they did a really good job. And then of course there was the hardware to assemble the bottom to the top frame. Which brings me to my next point. And install for this machine is very easy. You're just attaching the top to the bottom. There's four screws on the left, four screws on the right, and then just a couple of screws for the uh, filament runout sensor and a couple of screws for the uh, spool holder that attaches to the frame. As I did in my last printer review, before actually assembling this, I flipped the machine over, I popped the hood, and uh, wanted to show you guys what was inside. So. Uh, the cable management was really nice looking. There was a 12 volt, 350 watt power supply. There was a completely large separate MOSFET board, which basically turns on and off or the power to the uh, large heated bed. So that was nice to see. They're using a Tri-Gorilla motherboard, which is what I think they used on the Costla I had back in the day. So they've been using that for a long time, uh, which is essentially running the same uh, CPU as like a Arduino Mega would. That CPU is the AT Mega 2560. It also had uh, Palulu drivers, so they are removable. They were just the A4988s, which I was a little bit disappointed with because of the fact that this is a uh, new offering from Anycubic and with so many machines um, coming standard now with the more silent 2208 or 2209 stepper motor drivers, I was a little bit disheartened to see that. Luckily, again, since they are not welded to the board, you can just take them off and replace them with more silent steppers, but at this machine being their latest machine, I do think that that at this point probably should become a standard. So that was what was underneath it. I closed it back up. I uh, then again assembled it and I powered the machine on. As mentioned, it does have manual bed leveling. So I turned the machine on, went to the LCD screen and clicked home to make the head drop down and then flipped the switch on the back of the printer and with my hand manually moved the hot end around to the front left, front right, back left, back right and center of the machine using a tiny sheet of paper just to quickly level the bed. It was actually almost level as is. So it just took a little bit of, of uh, turning with the big knobs before it was ready to rock and roll. Once I was done with that, I loaded up some uh, silverish gray PLA that I had laying around and I popped in the SD card and then I went to navigate and see if there was any pre-sliced files on the card. I did find one that was called two owls. So I went ahead and hit print. print and sure enough out printed two owls uh, one with a hat and uh, another one looking at the owl with a hat it took quite a long time I don't have the exact time I think it was like a five or six hour print which is very very long for uh, how small they were the quality did turn out really good which makes me think that they sliced this at an incredibly fine layer resolution much much finer than I would ever slice something uh, but yeah the print turned out great and I was ready to do something much, much bigger. One thing I will say about the touchscreen on this printer is that it is very responsive and it is bright and colorful. The only downside I have to it is that the uh, images or the emblems on the touchscreen are kind of really big, which to a lot of people that could be a positive. But for me, 
I like having just kind of more mid-sized icons where I can see everything from one main menu and then go into sub-menus. Well, on this one, if you go under settings, there's actually like three pages of settings and for whatever reasoning, it just didn't seem very intuitive as to where I needed to click to get to the next screen. So I'm sure that's something that if you got the printer would just, you'd become familiar, you know, familiarized with and familiar, familiarize yourself with, um, but for me, not having used that, it was a little bit foreign to me. But last year, I picked up some dirt cheap rainbowy filament off of Amazon. I think it was on super sale for like $6 a kilogram, and I got two of them. The reviews were really mixed, and so I wasn't really expecting anything to be uh, too good with it, but for the price, I just had to at least pick some up. I ended up printing out a few random things with it over the last year, and uh, my fiance Aaron really, really likes this filament, so I kept the other spool of it for something special, and with how big this printer was, I just decided I am going big. So I looked online at all sorts of models, just kind of going like, nope, nope, nope. And somehow I ended up searching elephants on my mini factory. And I found a model called Serene Elephant from Jaka over on my mini factory. And I loved it. It's just this really peaceful looking elephant that's kind of like in a meditation pose. And um, I knew that I wanted to print it. I thought it would look amazing and it would look really good scaled up so that way I can uh, use the majority of the filament. So I went ahead, hopped over to Cura. I imported just a regular CR10S Pro profile because the filament length is very similar on this machine and the Bowden length, um, the, the path that has to travel through. So I figured that would be a good starting point. I imported the model from my mini factory. I scaled it up to the max size the printer could take, which was right around uh, 300 millimeters and um, sliced it. And I sliced it at just, I think, 10% infill. It was gonna take a total of 60 hours and use 800-ish grams of filament, which was perfect because I had a whole kilogram to use. And so I loaded it up. I, I went from the tiny little test file to this massive file and I hit print. I watched the first few uh, layers go down. It was good. I stepped away. And uh, because I'm working from home, like literally right here, over the course of the next 60 hours, I watched it slowly growing bigger and bigger, and um, I am pleased to announce that it completed without a hiccup, and it is an adorable model. Um, I think the printer did a fantastic job. One gripe I have, which is my doing and not the actual printer, is that you can see the infill through the walls, and I think I had three shells or three perimeters around the outside, but I think adding a fourth one would have helped to mask that a bit more, but it kind of just, like, if you don't know that that's because it's 3D printed, it just looks like it's a feature, but for myself knowing that, like, ah, I didn't intend for it to be like that, I was a little bit, like, bummed about that aspect of it, but as far as the printer goes, considering it just, you know, shot out a 60-hour print without any skipped layers or without any shifting or without any clogging or jamming or whatever, uh, I was really pleased, and this thing is awesome. Um, definitely a model that we're going to be keeping and finding a place for in our, uh, in our apartment, so that turned out killer. So before moving on to something else, I wanted to do one other PLA print. I loaded up that silver or grayish PLA that I had initially printed the owls in. I found a model of the Millennium Falcon that I have seen quite a few times printed. Uh, it's really cool. It, it prints vertically, so it's just really kind of bizarre looking. And I figured that this would be also a good test just to see, uh, re kind of reconfirm my love for this build plate because I know that it works really, really well. So I downloaded the model. Um, I turned the model vertically, so that way when the bed was going back and forth, the model would be going this way versus this way back and forth just to kind of help with the mass, I felt like it would help with the wobble, and it was actually recommended by the um, creator of the model over on Thingiverse. So I went ahead and sliced that at 200 microns uh, or 0.2 layer height in Cura, and I slowed it down a bit just because again with the mass of the print going back and forth, I didn't want it to flop over, and I hit print. And I think it was roughly a 15-ish hour print, and it turned out great. Um, there's definitely some room for minor retractions that I think I probably could have tuned a little bit better, but all in all, considering the amount of detail that this thing has, and just off of a stock printer, it being able to complete it to the level of quality that it did, uh, I was really, really pleased with this and thought that it turned out just great. It was awesome. Next on the list, and this is not something I print on every 3D printer I test out. I actually don't print this material on most, but because Anycubic in their listing claimed that the new extruder would allow you to print in a variety of TPUs, I had to put it through its test and see just if this was accurate and how well it worked. So um, my cell phone has been using a printed case for the last year. I printed it in NinjaFlex. It's actually in my, in my video probably over a year ago now. I printed it on the Ender 3 that was modified with a direct drive in NinjaFlex. And 
It's been awesome, but through me showing it to people, taking it on and off, it's gotten pretty worn and I figured it's time for a new phone case. So I went ahead and downloaded the phone case from my uh, Thingiverse for the iPhone XR. I went ahead and sliced it. I slowed down the speeds to like something around 20 to 25 millimeters a second, uh, zero retraction, and I um, hit go. The TPU that I used was some bizarre TPU that I got about a year and a half ago that is incredibly flexible. Um, I don't know the shore hardness, but it is definitely around the realm of, of uh, Ninja Flex or maybe even softer. I've never had success with it, even on direct drive machines. So I wasn't really anticipating it would turn out great, but I at least had to give it a go again for the, for the sake of science. So I loaded it up, I hit print, and I watched it lay down just the first few perimeters and start to fill in the first layer. And it was looking pretty damn good. I was impressed. And it was, it was printing very slow because of the fact that I had slowed the print speed down so much. So I walked away and I came back 45 minutes later and was sad uh, because it did about half of the first layer perfectly. And then it must have buckled inside or something because there just wasn't the correct amount of filament coming out. So I went ahead and I cleared that off. I loaded in some other TPU that I've had laying around for probably four years, uh, Sane Smart Black TPU that I just, I hardly use TPU for any project, so it just kind of sits there and occasionally I use it. So I'm sure this filament was very, very wet, but I loaded it up and I did not change any of the slice settings, same speed, same no retraction, all that stuff. I hit print and roughly eight to 10-ish hours later, it completed and it completed well. Um, if you look at it, it might not look the most beautiful, but I honestly am gonna attribute that to the fact that again, the filament's four-ish plus years old. I did not dry it, um, but there was no issues with consistency. Um, it laid down a nice clean bead the whole entire print. It's strong, I've been able to fully flex it. It's actually been on my phone for the last four days being used and it, it works great. It's my new phone case. So um, yes, you can definitely do some flexibles on this printer. Is it gonna be as good as like a direct drive? Uh, probably not, not, in my, not from my testing, but for being a Bowden style setup, the extruder is good enough to do some basic TPUs or some semi-flexible materials, which is which is nice. So the last material I wanted to print was, of course, PETG. Um, that's pretty standard. I do usually do one PETG print on almost every printer that I review. Um, I've seen so many people over the years print out headphone stands and I've never done this. And my headphones, normally I put them on my desktop or on my desk, but there's a lot of times they end up on the ground and then I roll my chair back and barely dodge them and uh, that's not good because I use them for all of like everything, work, editing. So I decided this would be a good time to print out a headphone stand. So I found one again on Thingiverse um, and I went ahead and printed it out. My slicer settings were 250 on the hot end, 70C on the bed, 50% um, layer cooling and 200, uh, again, 0.2 or 200 micron layer resolution. I hit print and came back. This one took roughly 16-ish hours. I wanna say maybe a little bit less. I think it might've been more like 12, but uh, either way, it turned out really, really nice. The layers laid down inc incredibly consistency. Um, I did adjust the retraction, I think, to around 10-ish millimeters. Um, and it definitely seemed like that did a really good job because there was very, very slight stringing, but compared to what I've seen Pet G do on a printer that just doesn't have retraction set correctly at all, it was pretty impressive. And it, it turned out really, really nicely. And uh, yeah, I've got a headphone stand, uh, stand now, which is pretty sweet. But overall, I've had a really good experience with this printer. The bed material, again, is amazing. I've talked about it so many times in like a broken record, but I don't care. It is so good. And until you show me something that just blows out of the water, it is one of, if not my favorite, uh, at least stock build surfaces. I like the fact that it's using an E3D V6 type style hot end. I wish that it was just an all metal so you didn't have to modify it, but it will be a very, very easy upgrade if you do decide to throw in uh, an all metal hot end as well. But nothing is perfect. And there are two things that I wanna talk about with this machine that are kind of like meh to me and there's room for improvement with. So the first one I talked about earlier, it's just those drivers, the A4988 drivers. This machine currently retails at $400, which for what it offers <clears throat> isn't a bad price at all. That's pretty standard for a one foot by one foot by one foot build volume uh, printer. But again, those drivers, um, I could see if this was an older machine, but this machine was released either like Q4 of last year or Q1 of this year. So it's relatively new. The, the silent drivers have come down so much in price that they easily could have thrown in those silent drivers. And this machine is, is pretty damn loud. Like I, I will say that um, we our bedroom is down the hall and when the door was open, you can hear this thing printing. So um, easy upgrade, not gonna cost you a lot if you decide you wanna do that, but still I do wish 
that Anycubic, <clears throat> and if they do take my feedback, I do think moving forward, or if they make a V2 of this, um, certainly that's something they should offer. The second gripe I have, which is kind of a bigger one in my opinion, is the fact that it's a 12 volt system. To me, 12 volts is fine for smaller form factor 3D printers, but when you get to something like this that's got a 12 by 12 build plate, the time it takes for a 12 volt machine to heat up that build plate is just substantially longer than a 24 volt. So to give you an example, this bed says that it can reach 90 Celsius, at least that's what the technical specs say. I decided just to see from stock in this room how long would it take to get to 80 Celsius, which you'd at least want 80 or 90 Celsius if you're printing with ABS material, and it took 10 minutes. And that's a, that's a long time. Like for something like PLA, it's no big deal because I only heat it up to about 60 C and that's pretty dang quick. TPU as well, PTG 60 to 70, 70 took a bit longer, but when it was trying to get to 80, it was really climbing slow. And that's something that they totally could alleviate if they just switch over 20, 24, uh, to a 24, 24 volt system. For example, like Creality with their CR10s, their, their whole first generation of them was 12 volts. And that was one big gripe a lot of people had. And since they've come out with their V2s, they've standardized 24 volts for their machines. And I do think that Anycubic seriously should consider following in those footsteps. So again, if you're someone that primarily wants to get a machine like this and you're, you know, you're probably gonna just print with like PLAs and maybe play around with some flexibles and do some PTGs, you're fine. And I, I get that a lot of people are not really printing with ABS, at least not as much as, uh, you know, backtrack five or six years ago. But for those of you that do want to print in ABS, you're the ones that are really gonna um, have the most issue with the heat up time because again, maybe if you print ABS every blue moon, the 10 minute heat up time for the bed's no big deal. But if that's your go-to material, those 10 minutes start to add up really, really quickly. So those two things, I really think um, Anycubic should consider upgrading. The silent drivers is definitely a much easier revision versus swapping everything to 24 volts. But again, I wanted to give some feedback and kind of share some insight on this machine. All things considered though, I do think that this is a very promising machine and if you are looking for, if you've either been looking at the Anycubic i3 Megas and you saw the Mega X and were interested, I do think it's an awesome machine and it has shown that it can print beautiful parts if you're looking to um, add a machine to your already you know, established lineup of machines or if you're looking to get into uh, 3D printing, again, with that bed, you really can't go wrong. It, it just, it works incredibly well. So on that note, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I will place links in the description down below to find out more or purchase one for yourself. Don't forget to smack the like button and subscribe for more great videos. I make a video every single Saturday, so there's always some fresh content coming out. On that note, guys, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I hope you guys are all doing fantastic, and I will see you in my next video. Peace, guys.